He is, he is not only a Hall of Famer, but he is one of the great colorful characters in the game's history, and it's my pleasure to introduce Tommy Lasso. Thank you, Bob. That's, that's just wonderful, and that film was great, yeah. You did it again. It's good to see you, Bob. This guy, in my opinion, and I've told him this, so I'm not saying it for the first time. One of the greatest announcers we have in the game today, right here. And I was hoping that I'd get up here. I thought I might be late for the baseball game tonight. <laughs> but I'll tell you something, it is great. I mean, just to see, look at these guys. Look at them. Look at the enthusiasm, the looks on their face. <laughs> Timers, boy, I tell you, I thought I was the youngest guy in this room. <laughs> but anyway, uh, when Bill called and asked if I would come here, he said, Tommy said, uh, you know, every time I hear about you and uh, you always say how proud you are to be living in the greatest country in the world. I said, that's right, Bill. He said, then you definitely believe in the constitution of this country. I said, yeah, I do. He said, then you definitely believe in free speech in this country. I said, yeah, I do. He said, good. You're going to have to make one in St. Louis. So, here I am. You know, Bob was talking about motivation. I can remember that I went to Mass in St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, and someone must know known I was there, so they said that the Cardinal wanted to see me. And the only Cardinal I knew who real good was Stan Musial. <laughs> so I go back into his office, and he said, you know, every time I hear you talk, you talk about motivation. Are you trying to tell us that you have to motivate players making five million, eight million a year? I said, that's right. I believe this that everybody in this country, from the President of the United States on down to the lowest job, needs to be motivated at some time or another because they're not really doing the best they can. So he said, when, when did you believe in this motivation? I said, I knew the day that I could really motivate players. I was managing Spokane at the Pacific Coast Lake. We're playing in Tucson. We got them beat two to one, bottom of the eighth inning, and they have the bases loaded and two outs. And I had on the mound a little left-hand pitcher named Bobby O'Brien. And I thought, let me go out. I got to fire this guy up. We got to get this guy out. He gets this guy out, we're going to win this game. So I go out to the mound, and I said, Bobby, if the heavens could come apart, and you could hear the voice of the big dodger in the sky talking to you. And he says to you, Bobby, this is the last hitter you're going to face on earth, and you're going to die and come to heaven. I said, son, how would you like to go facing the Lord? Giving up a base hit or getting this guy out? He says, Gipper, I want to go facing the Lord, getting this guy out. I said, then how do you know that when you make that next pitch that you're not going to die? And if you are going to die, son, get this guy out first. <laughs> and before I got in the dugout, he threw the ball. The guy got a base hit. Two runs scored, and they went ahead. And now I got to take him out. And I'm walking out. I said, God, I had this guy right where I wanted him. When I got out, I said, Bobby, what happened? He said, Skip, you had me so afraid of dying, I couldn't concentrate on that hitter. Now, that is motivation. If I get that guy to believe he's going to die, I sure as hell can make him believe that they can play better, I'll tell you that. So motivation is very important. Well, I have a guy here sitting here. I'd be remiss if I didn't introduce him. He's been a friend of mine for well many years. I used to call him the Tut Shore of St. Louis. Here's old Charlie Gito. Charlie. Thank 
This young man's been with me for 10 years. He's been great. Colin Gunderson. <laughs> you gotta wanna talk to me, you gotta go through Colin. <laughs> but you know, we're talking about the managing, as Bob said. You know, people say, what's it take to be a good manager? And they say, you know, first thing they say, you gotta be honest with your players. I said, that's wrong. <laughs> no, you gotta lie. <laughs> really do. I'm serious. You got to tell them how great they are. And they're not. You got to make them believe that they're great. I remember that we were, uh, we were having a meeting, an organizational meeting, and Campanus was planning from the, for the next 10 years, we got to be competitive. And we're going over all the players. And we had come to catch him. And he said, we, got, we need help in catching because we got Tennis Air and Duke Sims catching. Those guys, we got to get catchers. So I just raised my hand. I said, uh, I got a guy I think would make an outstanding catcher. He said, who? I said, Joe Ferguson. He said, here's a guy, he's got a great arm. He's a great basketball player at the University of Pacific, so he's agile. And he can hit a ball out of Grand Canyon. Let's make him a catcher. He said, good idea. So over in the instructional league, I said, Joe, we'd like to make you a catcher. We think you can make, become a good catcher for the Dodge. He said, Tommy, I love you like a father, but I'm not getting behind that plate. So every night I talk to Camp Ann. said, you got him back there? Can't get him back. I said, I'll get him there. So one day I said to him, I said, hey, Joe, you ever hear about a guy named Bill Dickey? He said, yeah, I read about him. I said, started out as an outfielder, became a catcher, and he's in the Hall of Fame. Did you ever hear about a guy named Gabby Hartnett? He said, yeah, I read about him. I said, started out as an outfielder, became a catcher in the Hall of Fame. I said, did you ever hear about a guy named Ernie Lombardi? He said, yeah, he lives up in San Francisco where I live. Started out as an outfielder, became a catcher, and should be in the Hall of Fame, which later on he was. So Ferguson picks up the shin guards, puts them on, chest protector, and starts catching batting practice. So I called Campanis. I said, well, I got him back there. He said, how did you do it? And I told him, he said, hey, Tommy, those guys were never outfielders. I said, you know it, and I know it, but Ferguson didn't know it. I got him back there. So it's another lie, see? So in order to do that, you, you have to lie. Some way or another, you're going to have to lie to those guys. And so I can't say that you have to be honest with them. That, that, that doesn't work. You know, you know, people say to me, you know, Tommy, we, we, every time somebody asks you for an autograph, you give it to them. Why? A lot of people don't want to do that. I said, I'll tell you why I do it. Let's go back when I was in eighth grade, Catholic school, Norristown, Pennsylvania. Lived across the street from the school. And I found out that the nuns were going to take the patrol officers to see a game in Philadelphia free of charge. And I knew I wasn't going to get down there any other way. So I stood out with that belt on in the snow, the rain, the hail, sleep, helping the other kids across the street because I couldn't wait to go see that major league game. I idolized major league players. I knew their batting averages. I knew the Yankees. Lou Gehrig, that wasn't his name, was Henry Lewis Gehrig. I know uh, the catcher was, um, what, uh, what was his name? Uh, <laughs> William Malcolm Dickey. That was his middle name. And Joseph Paul DiMaggio. I knew them all, knew the middle names. I thought they were the greatest thing that God ever put on earth. So I made up a little book to get some autographs. And in the old shy park, Roy knows this, and yeah, W. When you come out of the visiting clubhouse, you walk about 20 yards with the people. And then you veer off to the right, and you're on the playing field. So I stood outside that door, clubhouse door, 
trying to get some autographs. And this one guy come out and he, he said, get the hell out of the way. Push me, I couldn't believe it. A major league player talking to me like that. I mean, it just broke my heart. And I bought a program for 10 cents. And so you can imagine, Emily, years ago this was. And I took it the guy's number and I looked in, his name was Buster Maynard. I said, that rat <laughs> would not give me an autograph. Well, about six years later, I'm pitching in the Sally League. And we open the season in Augusta, Georgia. And I get the first two guys out. And I hear a guy on the public address system saying, now batting for the Augusta Yankees, the left fielder, Buster Maynard. I said, that's the rat that would not sign my autograph. And the first pitch, what a sight it was to see this guy's toes pointed up to the big dodger in the sky and laying on his back, man. What a great feeling that was. I tell you. So he got up and I low bridged him again. Bat went one way, the hat went one up. Now he thinks there's something wrong here. <laughs> so, so he says to me, don't you throw at me again. I said, what are you going to do about it? He said, I'm going to have to come out there after you. I said, well, why don't you come on out and, and save me the next pitch? Because I'm going to get you on the next pitch. He said, don't throw at me. Well, I, don't, I didn't have good control, and I missed him again. <laughs> and here he comes. So we battled. The game's over. I come walking out of this little bitty old clubhouse in Augusta, Georgia. This guy walked up to me in civilian clothes, and he says, where's Tom Lasorda? I want to know who this guy was. I thought maybe he was a detective or something. I want to know who he was. He said, I'm Buster Maynard. I said, oh, you want some more? Let's go. He said, no, look. I've been in the game a long time. He said, I wouldn't even be playing here, but the manager of this team is a friend of mine, and he asked me to play for him. He said, I was in the major leagues. I said, I know you're in the major leagues. He says, and I, I know there's only two reasons why a guy will deliberately throw at a batter. One, he doesn't like him, and two, the guy's getting a lot of hits off him. I want to know, why did you throw at me? And I said, I'll tell you why. I asked you for your autograph at Shy Park in Philadelphia. You pushed me away and kept on walking. You broke my heart because I looked up to major league players with admiration and respect. He said, are you serious? I said, you better believe I'm serious. And he walked away shaking his head. So I tell my players, hey, when that youngster comes up and asks you for your autograph, you better give it to him, or he may grow up one day and knock you right on your ass. <laughs> so, you know, I've been with the Dodgers. I've been with the Dodgers 62 years, and we just celebrated our 60th wedding anniversary. And the guy interviewed me. Do that for my wife, she deserves it. <laughs> the guy kept, guys interviewed me, said, which of the two was the toughest to accomplish? And I said, no comment. <laughs> because, you know, when I started to come here, my wife said, where are you going now? I said, honey, I got to go to St. Louis. I'm going to meet some of the guys I played with and against, and it's going to be a great day for me. She said, you're not going out and make another talk, are you? I said, yeah, I have to go. She said, you want to know something, Tommy? I finally realize now, after 60 years of being married to you, that you love the Dodgers in baseball more than you love me. I said, yeah, but I love you more than I do football and basketball. <laughs> Soccer. <laughs> I just want to say this in, in closing. Thank Bob for coming. I want to thank these fellas right here. We were sitting here talking about things that we did, things that we believed in, how we don't like the young players of today. Because, you know, I think there's always been a big conversation about the players of yesteryear and the players of today. 
And you know, nobody's ever able to com compare. It's not why. Right. But the greatest comparison was given by Yogi Berra when he was sitting in the dugout and surrounded by a bunch of sports writers. And they were talking. He said, hey, Yogi, if Ty Cobb were playing today, what do you hit? What do you think he would hit? I mean, Yogi, without any hesitation, he said 367. He said, are you serious? You no, know, he said 227. He said, you serious? He said, yeah, he said. He said, this guy had a lifetime batting average, 367. And you saying he'd hit 227 if you were playing today? He said, yeah, after all, you got to realize he's 75 years old. <laughs> so that's the comparison between the players of youth. But we're sitting up here talking about the game. We're talking about the pitch count. I mean, we never heard of these things, the pitch count. I was the, there was a guy in here today told me, he said, hey, Tommy, I, I read about that game that you pitched in the, in the Canadian American League, 15 innings. I walked 10. I gave up 11 hits. I struck out 25 guys. The left fielder was a guy named Morehouse. I struck him out six times. I'll never forget that guy's name. <laughs> So, and I knocked in the winning run in the bottom of the 15th inning. Now, if I were pitching in that game today, I'd be out of there after the third inning with pitch count. When I took over coach or manager, what you want to call it, of the Olympics, every pitcher that I had on that team was sent to me with a pitch count. So I called one of the general managers up. I said, wait a minute. Why is this guy on a pitch count? He pitched all season. He said, yeah, but Tommy, he never pitched in the month of September because by then the minor leagues are over. I said, well, I'll tell you what. Our the, uh, the Olympics start the 1st of September. I'll tell him it's August the 31st and he ain't gonna know the difference. <laughs> so what the hell is the difference between one day? This guy can't pitch. Only so many pitches. And uh, I think about it, I had a team that I didn't even know. I had 24 guys on the team. The only guy I knew was, was uh, Pat Borders, who was catching when I was still managing. 23 guys, I didn't know who they were, really. And I said to my wife before I left, I said, I'm going to tell you something. Remember this. There's going to be a quiz 25 years from now who's the only guy that won a world championship in baseball and helped this team win a gold medal in baseball. And I says, she said, well, you don't even know them. You don't even know your players. I said, all I care is, is they're alive. <laughs> and I took these guys and I met with them for the first time. And I said, I don't know who you are. I don't know where you come from. I don't know if you're single or married. I don't know if you're mediocre good or bad. But I know one thing. When we get to Australia and we're finished, the whole world's going to know who you are. You know, want to know why? Because you're going to bring that gold medal where it belongs in baseball. You see, you do not represent your family here. You do not represent the school that you went to or your hometown or the organization that signed you. You now represent the United States of America. And you're going to beat those guys, those donkeys, the Cubans. They ain't never going to beat us. And you got to believe that. And so we came back with that gold medal. And the reason why we did was those guys believed. They believed that they could beat those Cubans. And by golly, Ben Sheets, he was on a pitch count. Bob Watson was the general manager, and he's hollering to me in the dugout. And he goes, hey, Tommy, he's giving me the pitch count. I said, sit down, boo. I ain't taking this guy out if God tells me to. And he pitched a three-hit shutout, pitched nine innings, and had never pitched nine innings in his life. So that was the big thing. I, we were world championships twice, managing all-star games. I've had a lot of, lot of success 
for 20 years, but I never had the feeling that I got when we won. Because, you know, they say coaches don't get medals in the Olympics. And people felt a little bad that I didn't get a medal. I said, hey, I got my medal when they put the medal around our players. I got my medal when they raised that American flag. I got my medal when they played our national anthem. And I cried. I cried because I knew that I had done something for my country. And I was proud to see those young men do what they did in beating the Cubans. They said they could never be beaten. And I said, why, if they never lost the game? Oh, yeah, yes, they did. Well, they're going to lose again. So we brought that gold medal where it belongs in baseball to the United States. And today I sit here with friends who have played the game, people out there who knew about all these fellas, people who knew about the St. Louis Browns. I heard Vince Scully on the radio the other day telling that they had one ball left, the St. Louis Browns. And about the eighth there, if they lost that ball, they had to cancel the game. <laughs> so, but when you look back, but you know, you laugh, but when you look back and see who the guys were on that team, they had some pretty good ball players, Roy Sears and, and Bob Turley and, uh, and uh, Don Larson and all of those guys. They were great players, but not as good as the Yankees. So that's the way it was. And today I, I look upon all of you and I say, that's really great that you're baseball fans. You would think about the Browns and you come to this luncheon to show your feelings about the game, to admire the guys who have played with the St. Louis Browns. Hey, I, I, I almost did. I had a great spring. Harry DeCapri came, told me, said, Tommy, we just talked. You're going to be one of our starters. Great. We come into Phoenix to play our first exhibition game against the Pirates, and Bill Veck is out waiting. So we get dressed in our room, we're gonna go play the game, and I get a call, I have to go to Marty Marion's room, our manager. When I got there, Bill Veck was there, he said, Tommy, I feel awful bad. I bought you for $50,000 and I can't pay the Dodgers. I don't have the money. He said, the American League, I owe them. He said, Baltimore promised me millions of dollars if I can move the franchise. The Yankees stopped me. And of course, a year later, when Vec wasn't involved, then they sold and went to Baltimore. Had I been uh, on that staff, maybe I wouldn't be the manager of the Dodgers today. Who knows? So all of you at the head table, thank you. I've enjoyed this luncheon so very, very much. And thank all of you. And I want to say this in all sincerity. When you go to bed tonight and you lay your head down on the pillow, thank God for all the good things he's given you. Sometimes you might feel cheated, denied, or deprived. Just look over your shoulder and see how many people are worse off than you. So when you do say your prayers tonight, if you have any compassion in your heart, you'll say a prayer for Tommy and the Dodgers. Thank you. <laughs>